<laughs> so I learned I can click the go live button without being on there. So that's a uh, that's interesting. Nonetheless, welcome to Vlog Thursday, number three hundred and twenty-six. True NAS Tech Talk Security and Live Q and A. I just have been titling these a little bit more generic because uh, they they're, they're not always that specific. And I actually really like all the uh, interactions and feedback and uh, things like that. People who email vlog Thursday at Lawrence Systems .com, um, I've been getting more emails. Well, this was a light week in terms of emails. So the emails came in, but not too many. Uh, but nonetheless, I like doing uh, some Q&A and some questions and all that fun stuff. So we'll dive into that. First, one thing I'm going to try to make notes on and be consistent on as I'm dragging this over here. Where is Tom going to be and when? And uh, I will bring this up. We talked about it last time. If you jump to the end, like the last 15 minutes of the vlog, I talked about MSP GeekCon. I don't have any other public events uh, that I can think of where I will be. But nonetheless, this is still, there are still tickets available. There's 37 days left if you are someone interested in going to MSP GeekCon. Uh, it's a pretty cool event and I will be there. And I, uh, I guess now, I wasn't originally speaking, but now I am. <laughs> so uh, they, well, panelist, a little bit different. So I, I, I got an invite to be on one of the panels, so they'll probably update that. And uh, But nonetheless, it's a, it's a cool event. It's driven by other IT professionals, specifically around the MSP space, but uh, it is led by IT professionals. It is put together by IT professionals. So it's not like the vendor-led conferences, which is something I'm excited about. Uh, that is something that comes up is a lot of the, for those of you that work in the IT space, you know, there's all kinds of events, but they're extremely uh, vendor led events, as in you get sales pitched to a bit much. And uh, yeah, uh, not as much fun to get sale to just listen to sales pitches. I, you know, I want to go interact with all the other people. Uh, you know, this is one of the reasons I like forums so much, but let's jump over to a question someone asked and, uh, this is going to be related to today's topic because I put TrueNAS because TrueNAS is today's topic. But someone said, recently I ran across another YouTube channel and in the process of setting up uh, to install apps on their scale install, they manually created folders in the shell. How do you feel about this? Any negative effect? No, you can create folders uh, to put things in the shell. I'm partial because data sets are uh, very flexible and offer you some extra features. I'm partial to landing the apps within TrueNAS to a data set. So when you're setting up any apps, if those apps, and we'll, um, I think this one goes to its own data set. So let's go ahead and edit this one. We'll take a look here. And it goes to uh, Mount Dozer True Church Fresh RSS. I probably have that as its own data set if I had to guess. I know True Church is its own data set. And hey, look, Fresh RSS is a data set as well. That's generally how I do it. I'm just, I was going to point out sometimes Tom, when he's experimenting things, it'd be inconsistent. But Fresh RSS is something I actually use all the time um, for uh, my news feeds. But I create a data set for each one. That's my preference. You can do it differently, though. The advantage, though, to uh, doing it as a data set, let's say, I have a bunch of folders, but I only care about backing up the data on a more frequent basis of one of those folders. Well, the data set replication of ZFS, where you want to replicate in some ZFS, you want to replicate a data set, is going to be not subfolder based. It is based on the data set. So putting each thing in its own data set makes the most sense to me. Uh, it also makes it easy to clone that data set somewhere else. So if that data set is going to get too big to live where it is, and maybe I have another pool I can clone it to, etc. The flexibility in my preferred method is going to be a data set for each app that you're running. Uh, so that's that's my answer for that one. Uh, it's definitely, you know, I would say the way to go to doing it. So hopefully that clears up, but it will work the other way. Um, Kenny, Lawrence shared one of the reasons I started a deep dive in IT. Thank you for helping me get into a career. Awesome. Congratulations on that. Uh, should our team use Vert Manager instead of... Uh, heavy XCPNG or Proxmox. I don't know. 
What should your team use? It all comes down to your use case. I'm partial tech CPNG because of its large scalability, but I mean, I don't think VirtualBox is a bad choice either. So we, we go all the way the other way. Let's throw VirtualBox. It's easy to manage. It runs on your desktop. If you only have one virtual machine to run, I've seen a lot of companies, uh, I've seen companies throw VirtualBox on a server to run some app, you know, or server, if you will, before Hyper-V. So Hyper-V wasn't an option. So it comes down to your use case. Um, I'm no expert at all in uh, Vert Manager. haven't used it, so. I'm building TrueNAS with a Ryzen 5. What SSD would you recommend for XCPNG storage? Um, only need two terabytes usable. I don't really keep up on the prices of them. Mo our business installations are going to be enterprise stuff. Um, for if, if it's an enterprise install, I mean, go with some of the, like even the ones I have in mine, uh, my system here. What, do, what drives are in these? Let's see what? Make sure I got the right screen shared. Um, manage disk. I think these are all microns in here. Yeah, micron fifty two ten. So that's what I'm using in here. These are nice, uh, but I, I mean, I don't keep up with some of the consumer ones to see what's out there. Hey, yeah, that's right. We didn't change it. We should. I, I got to change the brand. We'll throw the Lawrence Systems logo. I think the the home lab logo I, it still applies. I'm I'm here talking with a lot of people who are uh, home labs, so for sure. <laughs> Separating compute from storage, dedicated switch uh, for a storage network. It doesn't have to be a dedicated switch or storage network. Dedicated VLAN on that switch is a good idea. The system and the way you know I've got my rack review video where I show how our rack is set up. But let me. Pull up the office here. So if you look at our rack here and we look at the ports and pull up the port manager, you see I have um, certain ports. Not that one. Is it these ones? Which ones are they? These are dedicated to storage. So we have a storage VLAN and that storage VLAN uh, is, you know, on these. So you don't have to have a dedicated switch for that, but it should, your storage, if you have a dedicated storage network, it should be a separate network from the other things. Oh, that's right. It looks like I got to update things. I'll update these later. Forgot to update the stuff at the office. I'll do it after hours. There's people working right now. <laughs> <clears throat> data storage as a service. I don't know how you would, unless you're going to scale up to the backblaze level, I don't know how you would compete in the uh, data storage market. I mean, if you have a niche of clients and there's some relationship you have with those clients where they would rather trust you with their storage. Sure. Um, but I mean, there's so many companies offering storage out there, unless you've, innovated in some way different than the way the, the current offerings are. Um, you know, like Wasabi entered the market later. Wasabi, if you've listened to their engineering team, they've done some interesting things um, in, in the storage space to make storage more cost effective. So they're able to scale up their product differently. So Wasabi did something different. If you have an idea to do something different, but just saying, I'm going to offer storage, I don't know what the... Unless you either a have access to ample amounts of storage that you don't have to pay for, <laughs> and I don't know how scalable that usually is. Uh, I don't know how. I don't know. I, I guess I'd have to know the angle you're trying to go for. Just saying, I'm offering storage and offering it for the same price as uh, some of the other competitors would probably be pretty hard. It, well, unless you don't go with things like geo redundancy or uh, have it in a big data center, you have it somewhere low cost. So there's. Lots of things to think about in that place. So it's not that I'm saying it can't be done. I'm saying just a lot of thought has to go into it. Edge router 12 and QNAP files on NAS take 10 seconds to open from Windows. Going to be a long path name bug. I don't know. I don't use QNAP to know 
um, what particular bugs. I usually only highlight the security bugs that come with uh, QNAP. Can you elaborate a bit on the recent breaking update of TrueNet to start the new tra uh, uh, apps and new TrueNets are common? Reinstall in many cases. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting one. Choo, choo, choo. It's a race to TP0. <laughs> I don't know. Is that Jason or Brett commenting on that? Hmm. Um, I, so the, the problem with true charts is going to be, let me find it. So I'll share the tab, but I pulled this up and I don't know really what to do about this. There's not what you're, what you're running into is this. So true charts is kind of cool. I have true charts set up on uh, one of my systems and it's a, another app catalog. The problem with it is, and it's not that you can really, it, it's, it's challenging. When you take this system, and we'll bring it over to, uh, yeah, this system, because it's got the catalog in here. The problem with the way this was all done is lots of reinvention going on here. It seems odd to me because Portainer exists. If you're not familiar with Portainer, uh, it's just a easy way to handle... Um, Docker containers with a web UI like this exists. It works well. It's documented. It's uh, you can use your common Docker commands to get things deployed. What they're trying to do by orchestrating Docker with Kubernetes and the, the integrations that are over in the app world here in true NAS scale are much more difficult <laughs> and it takes a lot of engineering. So it's when you have First, their own stuff and the bugs that people have been complaining about within here of building true NAS scale with these images and, you know, still one of the silly problems that uh, is in here is going to be like this right here. Enable this host pass safety check. This is kind of annoying because some apps that they offer, the only way to get them to work would be to check that, but they warn you that it's not supported. So I'm like, uh, some apps, I don't, what, then what's what's the supported way? Because I, I have somewhere in here, I think there's now, let's see what we have. Yeah, here's Plex, an official app. How do I get the data in the Plex if I have to check the host path check in order to get it to work when you're telling me that's not supported, but the app is like this? So there's a lot of challenges in it. So there's no easy answers for this. And then here comes True Charts, a third party offering catalogs for true nas scale and now you have another problem their updates uh, may not be 100 percent aligned with the development of the true nas scale products so true nas scale updates may break two charts then we have two charts uh doing updates to redo how they want to do things and i'm like i've it, it honestly uh, when wendell did a whole video about running a virtual machine throwing portainer on it and just using everything in portainer and calling it great uh because it's such an easier way to handle things but so while we watch the development of true nas we're scale specifically the app portion is always going to be for the foreseeable future where there's always a lot of turmoil so it's not as much that i uh um I can really expand on it beyond that. Uh, Kubernetes is hard. Uh, read the debrief when Reddit went down. <laughs> was it like about a, I don't know, a couple of weeks back, maybe close to a month ago? Once again, Kubernetes is hard. Uh, and orchestrating all this can be very challenging. So that's it, it's going to happen. That's the best way I can describe it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, that was your email from two weeks ago that I read? Or was I'm not sure which email we're talking about. I have a lot of them. I see I see someone in similar a name. But maybe you email. Oh, okay. Oh, true NAS scale and their attitude. Yeah. The attitude question, which I didn't really know how to respond. But it's it's gonna be one of those things that it just <laughs> it's hard doing it that way there's there's a reason portainer and things like that um so that's yeah it's 
there's a reason Portainer exists and other ways to do it, but they've, they've chose this path. I think it's got a good future, but the here and now is going to be a rough go. Speaking of which, um, what, you know, let's comment and swing over to this real quick. Cause I do have, when you look at installed apps, the only thing I use from true charts at all is fresh RSS. Um, I wanted to try it, ended up liking it, but back to one of the reasons it, it has its own data set is in case anything breaks, like people are make, people get upset when their uh, NAS breaks, but they're not realizing like, I'm, and I'm probably not, I'm actually, I know I'm not following the way true charts probably wants to do this, but if you look uh, free fresh RSS back up to true charts, you notice how this is set to constantly be backing up. That's because I know it might break. I separated my storage of the data that's important to me in fresh RSS from the uh, application that may break with an update. So I don't worry about it because I can just grab the data and it's just, you know, it's a Docker container. I can load fresh RSS. I have a portainer system as well. Um, I can load fresh RSS in there and point it at the same data set and go, here you go. It's all set. I don't know. I guess it broke over here. I run it over here now. This is one of the reasons it's important to, you know, we, we talk about this a lot, me and Jay do, about how you build your applications, understanding how they're built. So you can have a repeatable build process. That way, if the underlying thing breaks because of an update, you can redo that build process in a predictable way. And you always separate your compute and application side from the data storage. You can have it all in one physical machine. We're talking about from a concept of, hey, the data lives in this data set called fresh RSS that gets backed up off of this NAS. That way, if this NAS goes away, I have all my um, data and the app can just be reloaded. By the way, Fresh RSS, I think I've talked about it before. I'm gonna do a dedicated video to it um, because I just love this app. Uh, it's how I read all the news. It's just solid for keeping up with everything without having to go to everyone's site. Um, you can click in like right here, this is uh, Reddit R system in, which I don't know why I subscribe to it. It's so much of it I could ignore because it's, like I predicted, everyone's problem is urgent until I call back. Reddit R sysadmin is really more complaints than sysadmin stuff, but that's what gets the engagement. But all right. Um, but it's just a nice way to jump jump around in here and go, all right, here, Microsoft Mux with print screen, first time in decades. <laughs> Fun. Um, present sensitivity. Present sensing privacy setting. Interesting. These aren't that interesting of articles. We'll click them as red. Then we can go to all of my unread articles that I have here. And uh, you, if I need to find anything, Fresh RSS is just awesome for that. I have some subreddits. I was playing around with the social media in it. That doesn't work very good. You can use Knitter to pull Twitter if you want to follow certain people. Um, but yeah, I'm going to do a video pretty soon on it because the YouTube algorithm is goofy for getting you your subscriptions properly. But if I want to know what's going on with Dave's Garage, I can click right here. If I want to see the latest from Computer File or uh, Craft Computing or Crosstalk Solutions, boom, you just go here. I can see each one of their updates and I don't have to go there. I know Jeff had a new video today. And so I can see the description of the video. Like if you're not using Fresh RSS, it's, it will put you back to the way a lot of news aggregations should work. I really recommend Fresh RSS. But when I do the video, I'll also make sure... Um, that I put all of my feeds in there so you can have everything I'm doing. Uh, the only thing you can't have is my Reddit. But let me show you something, though. And uh, let me see if I have this in my notes here. If not, I will I will have it. So I think it's... Uh, you can just go right to... So if you're logged into Reddit, you can own you can pull your Reddit as RSS. There's a page you land on for it. I'll have it. I'll make sure it's in the notes. I always forget where it is. Oh, there it is. Derp. It's under where it says RSS feeds. Basically, if you go to Reddit slash and I'll throw us a link for people who's curious. Um, Reddit press uh, slash feeds. That'll take you right to your own RSS feeds. And this is really uh, helpful 
for being able to like subscribe to Reddit to drive fresh RSS. So my Reddit subscriptions, which I'll make a list of them and dump them in there, uh, what I currently use for my Reddit subscriptions combined with uh, fresh RSS means I don't have to go to Reddit. But if I see something cross-posted in Reddit I find interesting, I think I should subscribe to that subreddit. They're all tech subreddits. I will just throw that back into something I subscribe to in my Reddit. And then from there, it pulls to fresh RSS. So I've got a whole process I've been using for a while. And uh, it might be helpful to people for, you know, how you keep up with the news without having a bunch of noise and garbage and uh, distractions in there. Um, the YouTube ones are kind of obvious because you can just add, a, you go into subscriptions and you can just add something from YouTube. Um, I also have multi-reddits set up in here. So those are, I'll, I'll, I'll dump all this out when I do a video on there. Cause it's like, it'll be a short video about using this, but I'll have a page with all my links in there. So if you want to start, instead of going, what, what site should I put in there? You can uh, start pulling all the same ones I have already, which is kind of cool because you can take any of these and uh, sort them out or add an RSS feed and group them all together. It, it, it's nice for sites that don't update frequently, but you're interested when they do, uh, so you don't get it lost in there. That's one of the reasons I have these set up like this. And of course, from that, you can always, when you're looking at the news sites, if you like only want to see things from a certain area, like I only want to see the latest from Krebs, there's all the Krebs stuff um, that's in there. He doesn't post very often, but you know when he does, you're like, okay, I, I can jump right to it. And then you can put an asterisk or star and save all these for later. Or like when someone had asked me the other day about this, like someone had a, a post I didn't understand, you know, was, but someone says, oh, I didn't see um, Western Digital uh, make the news. And I'm like, yeah, I did. It was covered in several spots. They just closed data breach. Like here's all the times it was covered um, from... February, uh, from April 3rd, April 8th, uh, 9th. And it made probably the show notes, if I had to guess, of this is the show notes for um, uh, level one text. So it's like, it's it, it makes it easy to find that data in case you miss something later that you marked as red. Uh, I know someone had a question here I wanted to answer. It was about gray log. Yes, the gray log video is coming along. Um, I should have that done soon. Can you filter out things? Probably. I usually don't filter out things. I, I choose, the, I, I simply only put things in fresh RSS I want. There's probably a way to filter things out. I think there is uh, some advanced filtering options somewhere in here. So let's go to the subscription management. Description, feed, category, uh, filter actions. There we go. Um, maybe. I don't see anything like regex filtering in here. CSS, cookie. Set the user agent, um, proxy feed, timeout. Hmm. Yeah, I don't see anything in there that would, I guess it depends what kind of filtering you're looking for. Let's see. Gray log, though, that is um, doo -doo -doo -doo. maybe on the settings on every source feed. I don't know. I don't know what you're trying to do, though. Like you can search for words or tags here and things like that, but I don't I guess it depends what kind of filtering. I usually just if, if there's a key word, I look for it because I have it keeping all these articles, um, even I just have, well, it's just keeping all these links for, I don't know, a lot of them. I forget how many, I think I keep like 90 days worth in here. You, that's kind of an up to you thing. There's, I could probably increase it. It really doesn't take much because it's just storing text in a database. So it's not like it's a lot of data as I'm not downloading the full article. It's just partials and, you know, it gets the, it doesn't, for example, pull any Reddit comments. It just pulls in the first part 
of uh, the Reddit, and I decide whether or not I want that to be a full, you know, if I want to read the full thing or not, I can go to the link or I can jump right to the comments on something. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I don't know what you'd want filtered. It would be the question. There's probably some add-ons. It's an open source project and it does have a plugin architecture. So you could probably add more things on there. And by the way, a lot of news sites, uh, you could get RSS feeds maybe for a topic of them. So it depends on the news site you're pulling. But yeah, some of them, you, you could take actually a larger news site, but a lot of them have an RSS for a category. So you can take a generic news site, but maybe they have a technology category and you can just pull the RSS feed of that category if you want. It's another way to handle it uh, as well. Um, I am working on a gray log video that hopefully will be done soon. I'm, it's going to cover gray log five Docker and how to configure all that. So um, any plans to do one? Yeah, I might do a new one because there's some changes. Um, they're not dramatic, but there's definitely some changes I can walk people through uh, on a new video. It's on my to-do list. It, that one's going to be a little while before I get, before I get around to it. Um, it, it's always one of those ones that start, it always has a lot of controversy around it because people always have their own opinion of the way certain things should be done. And, uh, what, but you know, it's still, it's probably worth revisiting. You know, it's one advantage of doing PF sense videos. And one of the reasons I've avoided doing some of the true NAS, uh, charts things is because the problem with all this, um, Uh, let's share this tab instead. The problem with all the true NAS church things is things are changing constantly. So if I do a whole video on something and there's buttons that are no longer there or a new button to solve a workaround gets added, the video isn't, the video becomes irrelevant too quick. So I've been slow to do it. I need to do a permissions video because that's a common question people have is how to set up the permissions. But the, um, but the, one thing for sure is just that, yeah, it's the whole charts thing is like a moving target. Now, they did add in TrueNAS their own. They're working on their own now. Um, this was posted and has been updated. So they have their own catalogs of apps. And let me see if I have this one has it. Here's just the apps from TrueNAS, not True Charts. So here's the official apps catalog from them. And if you go over and look at manage catalogs, they do this automatically when you, along the way, when you update it. I added the enterprise because I was curious to anything in there. But you have charts and community. So you actually have two of them now because um, they want to add more. So they're getting into the, you know, they're offering some of the apps themselves, probably because of the same problem people asked about true charts breaking things. So... Does our does fresh RSS blockchain changes? Does it need to be? Does it record changes? No, I don't think so. Like if someone changes the RSS feed, I don't think it logs that. Like if a news article got updated or changed, I think that's what you're asking. I don't think so. Maybe there's a way to do it, but I've not had a use case for it, so I've never looked for it. I guess I don't understand the use case. Is it to, to understand if a news article changed? But something that hasn't changed. Let's jump over to this because this is on my topic of things I'm aggravated about. So I posted this on March 13th of 2023. And this, I'll for anyone who wants to read my writing um, and my posts, we'll throw this in here. Um, I'll answer this question with a question. I don't understand what you're asking. You're, you're asking why VMware machines are slower than Docker. Virtualized machines have to virtualize an entire OS. Uh, any hypervisor that will virtualize the OS, Docker shares the kernel, so it doesn't have as much to run. It's, it's not trying to... Docker's not trying to emulate an entire operating system. It's a shared kernel with applications, basically sandbox and limited within Docker. So um, 
That's usually why Docker spins up really fast, I should say. Uh, the actual raw speed of how fast a database will run in Docker versus a virtual machine becomes an entire other uh, consideration there. But the problem I'm running into is the way TrueNAS scale, and I don't recall this happening with Core, but I don't have time to reload and uh, do these tests back and forth. But the bug still persists after the last update. And it's basically partly a problem, the fact that I have an Intel Atom processor. So this is my Intel Atom C3758. This is what ships in the TrueNAS IX systems boxes. So this is a current processor currently shipping in that the TrueNAS um, Mac rack mount mini. And if you have a encrypted drive data set, the problem you run into, and I walked through the whole process here, that's why I threw it in there. It really goes slow. It's, it's like 73 megs a second when it's reading data. Oddly, it can write it fast, but it can't read it fast. So if we're reading data, it reads really, really slow off encrypted data sets. And it's because it's only going to a single thread when it does it. And uh, I've done this testing and it's actually easy to demonstrate inside of this. So this is just, um, this is net data running inside my TrueNAS box. And if we start migrating files back and forth, let me pull my little file migration thing over here. And if I do things in a, um, let's see, we go archive, grab a file and copy it over. So we grab these two files real quick. What you're going to watch is how fast they transfer because this is non-encrypted. So with the non-encrypted here, we are able to achieve three gigs. Not bad. That's uncached random files that I grabbed. So we're, we're transferring pretty fast here. So we're about three gigabits. Now, here's the fun thing. I'm going to go take those same files and uh, copy them again because now they're cached. So you got those files in cache and we're going to copy, paste, and they're going to go even faster. We're going to see, let's see, 3.6. There's probably a peak in there somewhere if even faster. There we go. 5.7 uh, gigs, almost doubling the speed, 5.47 gigabits. No problem. But if I do this and I do this on an encrypted Okay, let me um, create the file. I got to create a new file in my encrypted area. Make sure nothing's in cache. I'm just, you know, DD, uh, grabbing, grabbing some random data and throwing it in there. Now watch what happens when I copy this file. So it created the file. And now we'll copy it. I'm pasting it. And I want you can watch what happens. This is out of an encrypted data set, and boom, we are we are in slow motion mode. We're 0. 0.6 gigabits, point, often encrypted. That's pretty substantial. And if we look as to the why, let's actually let this finish, because then we're going to zoom in and we'll talk about the why this happens like this. Almost done. All right, file copied. Let this catch up. So it's there's we want to zoom in. And if you haven't used net data, net data is awesome for gathering data like this. So here's our tiny little transfer. And if we jump down here to CPU, what do you see? This is CPU zero. This is the file transfer or CPU zero. CPU one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We seem to have a single thread problem. <laughs> so I'm able to the file creation was over here. You notice the file creation is multi-threaded. So it, it spread the load across these threads when I create the file, but when you read the file back, it's single threaded. Now, how fast or how much of an impact is going to completely be based on 
the processor's single thread performance. So this may not affect you. You may have a really fast processor and no, the Atom processor is not that fast. So it's when you're reading from it, single core, um, it just, it, it shouldn't be doing single core. Now, the weird part is sometimes it doesn't do single core. And that's the part I haven't figured out. Like there's sometimes it, it'll read when, if I write a file um, from my system and copy it over, and then copy it back, I guess it goes in the cache, but it actually uses all the cores to send it back to me. So it's kind of strange. That's why I did the uh, write-up for it. But this is only with encrypted data sets. The same system is able to transfer um, pretty steady off the drives at over three gig with, you know, while it's not encrypted. So... I would jump back to the questions after my rank. Good afternoon. So the whole reason I started watching Tom is uh, watching Tom is now my garage. The business went all cloud. PF Sense XCBG and TrueNAS old hardware rack. Good times. Awesome. Um, ever use Hoodoo? Yes, Hoodoo's pretty cool. It's a it's a good platform. Um, I wish in. I wish versus um, I wish I had access to developers that could write this is what I actually want to finish that sentence with. I wish there was an open source document management platform like Hoodoo. Um, I don't know of anything that's that good. I know other things exist, but I, I've not seen anything is full featured as Hoodoo is. And maybe one day when uh, something like it will exist in the short term, Hoodoo is a popular platform. Uh, it is proprietary. It's based on Linux. And it's, I believe they use Docker on the back end, uh, but it's a good system for people looking for an IT documentation management system. Greetings from WA, Seattle. Uh, single core speed issues with encryption related tasks. Yes. Uh, it, it single cores um, when there's a new random file created and you need that file copied back. Uh, if it's not cached, it only delivers um, off of an encrypted data set at single core. Also performance problems and hiccups and aggravation I was having uh, when doing videos. I had, because I encrypt everything by default, all my videos encrypted. Why not? It was never an issue when I used TrueNAS Core. Um, this issue was after scale, but it wouldn't happen all the time because most of the time from a video creation standpoint, you read these files and once my editing tools read them, they get cached. So what I thought was my video editing tool having caching problems when it was first loading up, turns out was TrueNAS having caching problems and single thread performance. So it's an interesting problem. I'm running crypto DS on ZFS, uh, but it's a private home setup. Privacy is the most important thing. Uh, still read at full gigabit speed from a two way mirror. You knew it. Yes. <laughs> uh, the CPU does have the um, AES and I, um, but it doesn't make any difference because if I'm not mistaken, it's not leveraging that. Um, well, maybe it is. I don't know. It's it's a my understanding from discussions I read outside of the TrueNAS world. It's the way Linux handles encryption with ZFS. I can't validate that. I seen developers saying that, but they weren't talking specifically about TrueNAS scale. They were talking about in general the challenges you have with uh, slower processors and Linux and ZFS encryption that don't exist in BSD because BSD does it differently. I don't remember this being a problem when this used to run TrueNAS core. So, yeah. But I just don't know. Uh, TrueNAS is not ever going to get NTFS. NTFS is awful. I don't know why you'd want NTFS support. No, there's no warnings. It just... it. It's just single threads back. There's not an error message because it's it doesn't error. It, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. It gives me the file. It just gives me the file using a single thread. I did confirm that this happens on a faster machine, but it's like unnoticeable on a faster NAS scale machine I have. Part of it's the fact that this is an Atom processor that doesn't have incredibly good single core performance. So it's more of a that problem than anything else.
Yeah, if you look, there's a way to reinitialize the packages. I should probably do a video because it's such a frequently looked up thing. It's either A, you broke DNS, that people break DNS, that means you can't get package updates, or B, the package um, update got corrupted. And there's a way to fix that. There's If you search their forums, um, there's several posts that tell you exactly how to do it. Yeah, this is a funny question. What certifications do your customers ask about? None. D doesn't come up. People really think this comes up a lot. And they just, I I mean, for as many clients as we have, it is, it is rare um, that it's come up. The funniest time it's ever come up, though, is a engineering company. And it's I was kind of put on the spot, and it turned out to be a great story. <laughs> so the owner... Um, they were really fed up with two previous IT companies that were kind of disaster IT. But during the conversation, we talked about this, this, and this, you know, did my little spiel of uh, why we should be the IT person and how we could help them. And we were looking a few, looking over hardware they had, et cetera. And at the end of it, they said, oh, this sounds good. What are your certifications, uh, Tom, that you have? I paused. So what are, is there ones you're looking for in specific? He goes, well, you know, the Microsoft and Cisco usual ones. I was like, well, I still be honest. I've been working in this industry since 1995. I don't have any certs. He goes, I like you. He goes, I was uh, about to throw you out if you started rambling on about how great certs are. I go, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, that's all the other guys could brag about. Every time we would complain about they didn't respond to something for two days, they would tell us how they have all these certified engineers and certified this and they have their Microsoft partner. And he, it was just kind of funny because he says, I'm so sick of people that I don't care if you're certified. Can you do the damn job? He goes, cause the last few people had a, had more credentials than I do. And he goes, they couldn't do the job. And I started laughing, but it's so rarely ever comes up in business. Oh, have you been using, have you tried GLPI? Mm. What is this? I'm assuming I'm Googling it. Oh, open source service management. Features. Manage hardware, software, data centers, link assets, help desk. Uh, interesting. I haven't seen this before. We use Snipe IT. Um, this looks a lot more extensive because it's got so much more stuff in there. Project management. Rules, restrictions, groups, log history, configuration. Is this uh, has like a community edition. Latest documentation. So yeah, it looks cool. IT management powered by open source. Help desk, financial, project administration. Manage hardware, software, and data centers, link assets, inventory, hardware, data centers, IP impacts, SIM cards, dashboards. Interesting. Manage software, hardware that manages transmits. Manage inventory. Hmm. So it looks a little bit more extensive than Snipe IT, but Snipe IT is really nice. Don't you need NTFS for AD support? No. Do you plan to examine Unraid 6.12 with ZFS? No, not on my to-do list. I don't really feel like buying a license for Unraid. It doesn't fill any gaps that I have with TrueNAS. Uh, I know a lot of people like it, but... By the way, this is something that is going to be like 
the argument people have almost always for using on RAID is going, I want to be able to expand the drives whenever I want. Well, ZFS doesn't let you do that. It's a ZFS thing. So Unraid with ZFS is going to create the problem that you liked Unraid for back to, oh, I guess this isn't the best idea. So a lot of people who their use case is that is it's going to break it. So. Yeah, Packet Fence has been around a while. Uh, Chris from Crosstalk just recently talked about Packet Fence. Matter of fact, um, hold on here. If we go over to my YouTube and we go over to Crosstalk Solutions, there's his uh, latest video talking about Packet Fence. There you go. So, yeah, Chris did a video on it. Packet Fence has been around for a minute, so it's a neat product. I have not used it. I don't have any, I don't have enough experience to do any tutorials on it. Uh, but nonetheless, I am curious about something, though. This has me, I, I like Wendell a lot. And uh, from level one text, he's lots of fun. Let's start closing all this stuff that I have open and do this. All right, less tabs open now. <laughs> Model given access to a dot matrix printer. What could possibly go wrong? I don't know what he's up to. <laughs> he's connected chat GPT. I'm assuming he's the large language model. Uh, to a dot matrix. A oh, large language model given access. So I don't know what Wendell's up to, but uh, it looks fun. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> So plus one for GLPI, we get a lot of value from it. Yeah, it sounds like a neat tool. Maybe I'll take a look at it. Seems interesting. Oddly, I didn't get any new emails. I'm going to wind this down here in a minute because I got stuff to do. So I'll go till 4.30. Gives us 12 more minutes. Ah, yes, the, the office rooms full of matrix printers. Fun times indeed. Lots of stuff. Too many people twittering. But I think it's all, all I had for really the topics today was talking about sure NAS. Uh... I thought about, I don't know if this is a good video topic. Maybe I'll ask some of you. Um, basically, the um, the whole, the question of like with using net data for troubleshooting, I thought about, do I do a video showing how I used net data to understand the problem with uh, TrueNAS? Like it gives people something to think about in terms of this. And I love net data and I like excuses to talk about it because it's such a cool uh, project. And I can, you know, this, this was just invaluable in figuring out like, hey, look at this slow transfer problem I'm having. Five gigs here, but 0.6 here. <laughs> So I don't know if that's a good video topic or not. I will probably do an updated on TrueNAS. I mean, updated to the latest TrueNAS scale, but it's it's not that major of an update. The bigger the bigger challenge, of course, is all in the application problems people are having with it. Uh, between Tom and Wendell, that's about fifty percent of the tech YouTubers I watch. Yeah, Wendell's great. I love I. I like chatting with Wendell anytime I get a chance. He's just full of knowledge and uh, he's a very helpful individual. His videos are always great. Uh, with PSNS Plus, did you lose static mappings when you updated? Not at all. Uh, static mappings all work perfectly fine when I updated. No issues at all. I did see there's a new version of PF Blocker. I didn't see what's new about it. 
I updated that the other day too. Um, but yeah, I register. I have everything registered. So I uh, didn't have any issues. All my registrations are still there. Didn't update lost time mapping. No idea why. I've as a matter of fact, for all the updates we did, um, I've never seen that. So someone asked this question. You're asking about VRP and PF sense. So common address, let's zoom it in. It makes easier people to read. Common address resolution protocol was created by OpenBSC builders as a free open source redundancy solution for sharing IP address from a group of devices. Similar solutions already existed, uh, such as virtual router redundancy protocol. However, Cisco claims is covered by a patent. So I guess that's why they use a different one. So I, I, is that the question you were asking or the answer you were looking for? I'm not sure which. Art of server, bite my bits, serve the home, and others need to get together. A home lab convention like LT or home labbers and SMB instead of hardcore gamers. Um, yeah, that could happen at some point. Some point. I, I imagine, you know, we do the home lab meetup, the self-hosters, we would call ourselves or something, you know? Um, because you're right, the other communities are way more leaning towards games and it's not that there's no one who games that's also a home labber but you know there's um uh, it's a different niche of people who are focused on self-hosting things my unify ac pro will not adopt my two pf sense i don't know why that would be there's not anything in PF Sense by default, provided you allow it internet access that would do it. But, you know, it's someone had posted it in my forums about a problem they were having, but they failed to admit they had blocked ports and set up SSL inspection. And that was what was causing things that didn't have certificates not to get out or some type of comment like that. And I'm like, you really have to disclose what you changed uh, because normally it would work. But if you started changing settings, those settings might be the why. Like a person tried to block everything with PF blocker and they were trying to figure out, you know, how to how to get something working because every time they turn on PF blocker, everything stopped. I'm like, you got to start turning off rules and reading through the logs. Um, it, 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 that's still a common problem. As much as I try to reply to everybody in forums, I, uh, I say, where's the logs? Sometimes it's the reply. And it's weird how I get dead aired on that. Like, I'm having a problem with IPsec dropping. Got some logs. That was a week ago. Person didn't reply. <laughs> New install, no changes. Where are you trying to adopt it to? That would be the next uh, question. Huh. LTS, first move, reset to defaults. Yep. That's... um. I joke that that's a lot of my consulting work is resetting things to default. But where, if it's new install, no changes, where are you trying to adopt it to so we can determine um, where the choke point is? I mean, is the controller on your network? Is it external in the cloud? Is it on someone else's network? Are they blocking you? And I don't know if we'd be able to troubleshoot all this in here. Forum posts are better for uh, more in-depth troubleshooting. Oh, and I don't know how this works yet. <laughs> Speaking of that, let me do something real quick here. Mm. All right. I'll sort that out. But uh, it, within my forums, they added a new feature that I turned on, but I don't know exactly how it works yet. Uh, I don't know if I'll regret it. I like forum posts for, you know, having 
the more in-depth discussion on things because people can get details and post things in there and, you know, post all the details so you can get help with whatever it is you need help with. But they added a chat feature inside of here. I turned it on and I don't know if I have the restrictions set to only staff, um, but I don't know how that works in discourse. So that's been on my to-do list is to um, figure out how the chat works. So if I'm online, I don't mind chatting with people, but I don't want it to notify me um, all the time. But yeah, the, you know, my forums are actually really, I didn't realize how active they are until I started pulling some of the analytics data. And I'm like, okay, they're, they're really busy. And uh, because of that, there's, um, you know, I want to make sure I'm adding features. Matter of fact, it was this one. Oh yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause you can see like this here, the true NAS versus Synology, there's just a lot of activity in some of this uh, has got a lot of views, but you know, I try to post in my forums um, a lot of detail. Like this is the chart. So here's like a, a comparison feature all broke down right here. Unfortunately, it's not wide enough. So I did the firewall video. I put that in a Google Docs because it was easier. Um, but then nonetheless, it's got, you know, a lot of good info I can put together with all the links where you can find things. Uh, and I have to put my stupid face on there so people will click on it. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Any other questions? We got four minutes left. Any other questions for the last four minutes before Tom wanders off to go do the next thing I'm supposed to do? I have only a few more work things to do. I was just happy to get out on my motorcycle yesterday. So that was the thing. I'm actually going to go uh, get some exercise today. Bicycle riding today. Motorcycling yesterday, but it was actually pretty muddy out. So I didn't get to <laughs> I didn't get to go everywhere I wanted to go because it was so swampy. I didn't want to my bike sucks getting out of the mud. It's heavy. And I didn't feel like getting all muddy. I'll play in the mud to an extent, but not when it's that deep. Oh, uh, let's see here. Motorcycling aftermath. I mean, I've got all kinds of. Probably have at least, a, I don't know, somewhere I got some probably muddier photos. I definitely have these. <laughs> Sometimes I crash. Yeah, lifting this bike up after I crash it is always fun. It's good exercise. This is actually up north. They have all the um, oil rig things. So <laughs> this is what I do when I'm not doing tech things. I go disappear on a motorcycle. Sometimes I ride my bicycle too. Uh, that's when I want to get exercise. I'll do that. I don't know if I have any. This is the. Uh, this is the bike I ride. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I also have a pedal bike, a moped, and an electric scooter. So, yes. <laughs> but this is the bike I, I go riding on when I, uh, when I want some exercise. Yeah, recumbent bikes are fun. Yeah, I take my... Uh, Actually, maybe I'll go here today. This is um, this is one of the parks. You know, there's nice little paths around the swamps and stuff. It's always kind of cool. Oh, the old Honda. Yeah, I was riding that. I, I rode that to work the other day. Um, 
Yeah, picture that somewhere. Where is a picture of my Honda? If I take motorcycle, Google will find it. I know I've thrown pictures of it up here before, somewhere. There we go. Yeah, that's uh, 1972 Honda. So. <laughs> XCP and Jibago is sequential. Is sequential rights correct? I asked to make a decision for true NAS evals. Sequential. Yes. The writing would be sequential from uh, reading the backups on there. So that sounds that sounds like the right answer. Sequential rights. Hmm. Oh, there we go. So the, uh, I do take the Honda out in the middle of nowhere too. Uh, this is actually part of a big hill climb I did with it. So it may be only 90 cc's, but I was excited. You can't really tell how steep that is going down. Um, but you get the idea. I've, I've climbed to an elevation on my really old Honda. <laughs> I was, I, I take this thing all over the place cause it's just kind of fun. So now you, now you know my hobbies. <laughs> Most of them are tech, but every now and then I uh, put an audio book on and uh, go for a ride. In Zen Orchestra, can you restore a backup while a backup job is ongoing? Yes. I did look you. So the tasks are all independent of each other. Um, so if you want to run a backup at the same time you are doing them, it just each one's its own job. So if we throw this in here, I just did a new video on backups. So I cover all of them, but let's see. Let's look at this one. Just... All right. So if we wanted to do Delta backup testing demo, so we can run this right now and we'd see the job running over here. So here's the job backup test demo running while this is running. If we want to do a restore job, obviously I can't restore something that doesn't exist, but let's uh, grab one of the, actually, let's grab this here and restore the April 6th to the here. Uh, we're just going to restore this lab template. Now you'll see more jobs running. So each one's a separate task. You can run them all simultaneously. Uh, it depends on the resources you have available, of course. It, the speed of your setup is going to directly dictate how many of these before there's a problem. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they're all separate jobs, so they can absolutely run like that. I was having lots of issues with my TrueNAS NFS share into Proxmox, so I had a virtualized pro I had a virtualized Proxmox backup server and then add NFS shares as a data store. Turns out Proxmox backup server is amazing. Okay. I've not used it, so. Uh, do you use Ninja backup for endpoint? Not much. We're looking at it still, but right now, not much. We have, I think we have one client using it. They've done a lot of rewriting and it's gotten a lot better. Um, it just wasn't, it felt like it wasn't really complete and they did a lot to update the product. So they've actually, and I've talked to the product people over there. They're, they're great. They're doing a lot of innovation on it and things are happening. So. Oh, I have a tech problem I can't solve because there's no documentation for it. Can you make a video on how to solve my problem? Of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Hey, this is the challenge with some of these things. Like people like, hey, Tom, make make a video about this product that's in the market that doesn't have good documentation. I'm like, yeah, how am I supposed to learn it? <laughs> Old 9CC was used a long time ago by our post office, Silver Mail, uh, when I did that. Um if you look up Australia Posty Bike, so these are I've been want I've been debating about this. 
Um, but the Australian postal bikes, they they call them the posty bikes, are actually custom ones because they're they made them later. They're 110 cc's instead of 90, and they're 12 volt electrical systems. But yeah, the the posty bikes, as they're called, are pretty popular. There's actually one that got imported into the United States not far from me. Uh, he's asking a lot of money for it, but I've debated about buying it because I kind of want one. <laughs> So I just haven't decided if that's what I want to do. Uh, do you install XCPNG in software RAID? Uh, yes. The, the servers we're using all have standard software RAID. Working for major bio today. What, what we use bear cover for backup and restore. I've been looking into move to Acronis. Um, Acronis isn't bad. And Acronis isn't a bad backup. Um, currently we're using MSP 360, but I'm not going to lie. We're really eye and Veeam. Uh, my friend's company is all in on Veeam. They love it. And the, we've been looking at it going, okay, Veeam looks good too. But Acronis, my only complaint I had about Acronis was I thought their dashboard was a little bit cluttered. Uh, last I looked at it, but I mean, the product worked. Yeah, NS Travis says Ninja's made a lot of great progress in their backups in the last year. Lots of it. Can I do a conversation on my bike? No. I mean, I guess a bicycle, maybe, but you get a lot of wind noise. If you're using software rate, how do you manage for disk failures? Syslog. You just. This, I, I mean, they don't have anything native, but you can, um, share this tab. Gray log. You put things in gray log and we have a, uh, disk failure notice in gray log. So if one of our XC, great, all of our syslog for XCPNG gets piped into gray log. And if that syslog um, which also has your RAID status in there, has a disk failure, it triggers Graylog to let me know. So that's that's the that way it works. Uh, maybe one day I'll do a Veeam video. It's not, it's, I don't know the product yet. So until I learn the product, I can't do a video on the product. Uh, Conversion of a 90cc, 110, 12-volt motor, and electrical system. Yeah, it's it, there's not an easy conversion because the generator, the stator, and everything, the whole thing was architected. Um, the old Hondas, the 90ccs, the ones in the 50s, 60s, and 70s were all 6-volt electrical. So, yeah. Do you host uh, for customers on XCPNG at all? We don't do any hosting, so no, but it's we don't do it. At, we, we currently do no hosting. That's not a that's not a service we offer. We don't have our own data center. Um, so therefore we're not hosting any customer app applications. So it's it's more of a we don't do hosting answer than it is a um not hosting an XCPNG. <laughs> I'm using it right now. My this literally, if you go over, uh, pull the video up. So I have a video that says at it's the. AS Rock Ryzen 9. If you type in Ryzen 9 XCPNG, you'll probably find this video. Um, but I that we set this up with a pair of NVMEs and software RAID. Works fine. It's quite fast. Matter of fact, we can uh, share this. If you go to...
Lawrence stop video slash XCPNG. Um, you will, you will get to the playlist with all the XCPNG videos. Software raid. Is it ZFS or MD, uh, MD raid? I'm using MD raid on it. It'll, it supports ZFS as well, but these are the boot drives. The boot drives do not support it. The boot drives are mirrored. And so they're set up in MD raid. I take the extra not used by the OS and use it for local storage. So if you look at the um, local storage available on this system, uh, storage, elaborate local, um, this is the extra storage, and this is on an MVME. Well, a pair of them uh, more specifically. And you can see MD name, localhost. <laughs> That's because it's a RAID array. I started the blog early, so it's not pizza. Uh, as a PCI adapter, multiple space for four MVE drives, including fun. Have you tried this? Uh, bifurcation is the enemy. It's it's the headache you'll have. They make those uh, devices. It depends on how many PCI lanes you have and how the bifurcation works and if your motherboard supports it. If you get one that doesn't need bifurcation, um, it can do its own, but it will split the lanes because you can't get, depending on the slot, you each, was it two lanes per MVME? So you run out of PCA lanes, and when you start sharing them, you start losing performance. You won't get the full MVME performance on a lot of the ones that have four because there's not enough PCIe lanes going through that slot to do that. So you can, but I don't install it on a SATA DOM. Do you or if any of your customers use Starlink? Uh, yes. I don't I, I don't know what the topic would be about, though. Look, Elon Internet. <laughs> like, it's Starlink works. Um, Chris from Crosstalk did some videos on it. It's functioning, but I don't know. I, I don't know what else to say about it. Like, I don't have any commentary on it. We have clients using it. It's what's available to them. Because uh, they only have a single provider, and their secondary provider is Starlink. Yeah, I think Jeff Gearling, uh, I, he's did some videos on Starlink as well. I, I can't add anything to it. There's nothing original I have to say about it, and I didn't feel like buying one just to have it i don't even have a use case for it like it's a functioning internet thing but i don't have any other um like i don't have a need for it here uh why because we've been using fresh tests longer than we've been uh than the ninja ticketing and i think there's still things we can't do with ninja ticketing that we do in fresh desk MVME PCI Gen 3 X1 L2 Arc is fancy for two-way spinning SATA mirror. It's not quite a joke. I did the math, but it might as well be a joke. Yeah. Yeah, they're adding more features to the uh, Ninja ticketing, but there's just things it can't do that Fresh Test can. We have people like submitting forms. Um, I don't think there's any that I know of, at least. I don't think there's any way to do it. So we have different forms on here for support um, or hiring us. This is on our website. And uh, so this actually ends up in our fresh test. That's how we funnel all the data to one place because you kind of kind of consolidate the data. You can't have it everywhere. It just our job is heavily data management. <laughs> Uh, so, all right, well, I'm going to bounce out of here and, uh, your company's using some Starlink to replace Verizon hotspots. Yeah. Well, like I said, I haven't really kept up with it. Um, I don't use it, so I don't have a lot of opinion on it. 
Uh, do we use splash top remote control? Uh, connect wise control integrated is better. Splash top's okay, but it's not once you've used connect wise, uh, connect wise control, it's just good. It's um, it's pretty much like the industry top of the line good for uh, remote desktop apps for controlling systems. So everything else is like it's like any product you say it's going to compare to do you say and because we already have licensing for connect wise control i keep renewing the licenses for it so it just works that good that's that's why everybody uses it but all right i'm gonna let everyone go i'm gonna go do some other stuff thank you for joining see you all next week and uh see you in the comments the forums or wherever else later